Monday Night Raw, in the beginning, was an innovation. Before the introduction of this weekly television show, the WWF had a television formula that would never have survived into the late 90s. Back then, wrestling shows were taped at large arena shows, and these very matches would sometimes be shown weeks after they occurred. With the exception of Saturday Night's main event and the main event TV show, viewers of WWF television had become accustomed to these taped squash matches. It was mainly the only kind of showcases that the WWF would show for free. Saturday Night's main event and the main event, however, would show more competitive matches, and eventually, in early 1993, so would a new weekly television show named Monday Night Raw. Before Raw was a thing, WWF Primetime Wrestling had aired on the USA Network for 8 years. The show featured taped wrestling matches, again usually quick squash matches from house shows or venues such as Madison Square Garden, and Primetime was also filled with interviews, promos, updates and announcements. The show would evolve over the years but the main focus of Primetime would always remain unchanged. Primetime Wrestling was always kind of a recap show. Primetime would show highlights of the World Wrestling Federation's syndicated programs, along with presenting exclusive matches taped at house shows. The formula worked well for the early boom period in the WWF. Primetime Wrestling also showcased superstars who would come into the studio for interviews and promos, some of these being well remembered, but nothing is more well remembered than the duo of Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan, a pair who would become synonymous with Primetime Wrestling. Their chemistry was amazing, their humour was on point, and they played off each other so well that fans would tune in just to see Monsoon and Heenan. Soon, however, Primetime would change formats, and for a period of time in 1991, Primetime was presented more as a talk show with a studio audience in attendance. Later in 1991, and right up until the final episode, Primetime Wrestling became a panel show where hosts and WWF superstars would participate in roundtable discussions. By the time 1993 rolled around, live broadcasting was becoming a more prominent method of television production. Live TV often led to a higher success rate when attracting viewers, particularly in sports. The unedited nature of live television led to a feeling that anything could happen, and that in itself is a feeling that couldn't be replicated in a taped environment. Sure, it had risks. There was always the possibility for something to happen that wasn't necessarily supposed to, but this added to the attraction. Vince McMahon felt that the taped show format of primetime wrestling had become stale, along with other aspects of the WWF's programming, and a change was needed. Vince McMahon felt that a live weekly television show would reinvent the WWF, an uncut, uncooked and uncensored broadcast that would show competitive matches, main eventers, in-ring promos. It was really the whole nine yards in comparison to what primetime wrestling had become over the years. Pat Patterson said, It was Vince McMahon who came up with the whole idea. It was his idea to do a live weekly show. Live television was big in those days, and nobody had the guts to do a live weekly wrestling show. And knowing Vince, he likes to roll the dice. He had the guts to try it, and it was exciting. Vince McMahon said, I wanted to do something different in the business. I wanted to do a live show. I wanted to do something visceral, something that was indeed very raw. Hence the name, Monday Night Raw. We wanted a location in New York. To a certain extent, New York is the heartbeat of entertainment. In our business, Madison Square Garden has always been the mecca. Why not get close to the garden? The Manhattan Center was right down the street. Before talking about the venue and the logistics of setting up Monday Night Raw, you have to keep in mind also that business was down during this time period. Attendance in arenas was down, TV ratings were down across syndicated and cable shows, merchandising and licensing was also at a low. The WWF had just came out of a huge 80s boom period, and wrestling in general wasn't capturing the same audiences as it once did. While these stories of rolling the dice and creating a new visceral program sounds like great WWE PR speak, the truth is, Monday Night Raw was more of a necessity than anything else. 
In essence, something really had to be done. A big change was needed to WWF's TV presentations because at that point in time, the WWF were not pulling in the audiences that they once did. You'll also hear time and time again that the Manhattan Center was chosen because of its unique, intimate look and feel, and just like Vince McMahon said, the Manhattan Center was also used thanks to its closeness to Madison Square Garden. But if we step back and think about it, the WWF were not going to sell out 8-10,000 to 10, seat arenas on a weekly basis. The Manhattan Center, however, could easily get filled up, making each show look like a sellout, even though there wasn't that many seats to actually sell. I firmly believe that if the WWF were in a better financial situation in January of 1993 and they were creating a more compelling wrestling product, then Monday Night Raw would never have held a residency in the Manhattan Center. Of course, Monday Night Raw would turn out to be a huge success, so in the end, it was smart of Vince McMahon to change the formula, but it was definitely more of a necessity. The Manhattan Center houses two main venues, the Grand Ballroom, where Monday Night Raw made its debut, and also the Hammerstein Ballroom, made famous among wrestling fans thanks to ECW. Setting up the ring for Monday Night Raw, along with decking the place out with lighting, cameras and equipment, was reportedly a huge headache. Parts of the ring had to be brought into a 4x6 foot elevator, piece by piece, in order to get set up each and every week. Then of course you had all the other studio equipment that was necessary to produce a live television broadcast. It was indeed all necessary though, and as we know, it did pay off in the long run. So the very first episode of Monday Night Raw took place in the Grand Ballroom inside the Manhattan Center on January 11th, 1993. Let's take a look at the entire broadcast. The show starts off outside the doors of the Manhattan Center as Sean Mooney greets us to this new TV show. So the very first voice we ever heard on Raw, the man who welcomed us to this new concept that would go on to create more weekly episodes than any other show in history, was Sean Mooney. Bobby Heenan then shows up and tries to enter the building, but Sean tells Heenan that he has been replaced on commentary by Rob Bartlett. Who is Rob Bartlett? He was a comedian and actor who didn't really go down too well with wrestling fans, mainly due to his lack of knowledge on the subject matter he was trying to speak about on live TV, and also thanks to his questionable jokes on racial stereotypes. He thankfully only lasted around three months. Anyway, it looks like Heenan isn't getting into the building as we now get to see the opening for Monday Night Raw. The theme music here has become iconic. Its replacement theme, I Like It Raw, became nowhere near as well remembered as this debut tune here. The video package though, as iconic as it has become, really does give the impression that someone was going totally nuts with the video filters and effects. It's a product of its time for sure. It always reminds me of the opening of the 16-bit WWF Raw video games that done a great job of capturing the same visual effects, but yeah, today it does look very dated. Still, I'll never skip past it when watching these old episodes. It does set the mood for the time period. The next shot we have then is inside the Manhattan Center as Vince McMahon welcomes us to Monday Night Raw. This shot has become iconic also, you see this repeated on WWE TV shows quite often. Our commentary team features Vince McMahon, the aforementioned Rob Bartlett and Macho Man Randy Savage. After talking about the matches we are going to see, the high energy theme song plays as the very first competitor makes his way down the ring for the very first episode of Monday Night Raw. Coco Beware then has the distinction of being the very first man to step into a WWF Raw ring as he goes to take on Yokozuna in the very first match. This reminds me, we forgot to check if there were any dark matches on this evening, and yes, there were three. Two matches took place before the broadcast and one afterwards. Bob Backlund took on Damian Demento and won by disqualification and the Cheetah Kid defeated Johnny Rotten before the broadcast went live. The Cheetah Kid was Rocco Rock and Johnny Rotten was Johnny Grunge, who would of course work together down the road as the public enemy. Another tidbit here is that Damien Demento, who worked against Bob Backlund here in the very first match of the evening before the cameras began rolling, would also work in the main event during the WWF Raw broadcast. The dark match after the show went off the air featured Crush defeating Bam Bam Bigelow, another DQ finish here. 
Anyway, back to the live show, and Yokozuna destroys Coco Beware in around 4 minutes. It isn't competitive at all, the Birdman didn't really stand a chance. Rob Bartlett's comments about Coco Beware looking like Gary Coleman and Yokozuna being a big budded oriental went down like a lead balloon, and you have to imagine that Vince McMahon was already regretting his decision of hiring this guy to speak during wrestling matches. This Yokozuna match here is terribly slow, it's basically Yokozuna throwing Coco around for a few minutes, nothing to write home about and honestly, it feels a bit of a shame that the opening match of the very first Raw was such a throwaway. Yoko scores the win, as expected. 1993 was Yokozuna's year though, he would go on to win the Royal Rumble a few weeks later and headline Wrestlemania also. Speaking of the Royal Rumble, we are then shown a commercial for the upcoming pay-per-view. We are then back at the ring as a raw ring girl walks around with a sign, something that the WWF would continue to showcase in the weeks that followed. Vince McMahon then says we are going to see a pre-taped interview with Bobby Heenan who is hyping the arrival of Narcissus. Narcissus was being kept a secret, we didn't know who was going to play the character, but Bobby Heenan was letting us all know that Narcissus is even more perfect than Mr. Perfect himself, his former client. As we know, Narcissus would turn out to be Lex Luger, and he was soon renamed as the Narcissist Lex Luger, but anyway, this was a vehicle to get people to order the Royal Rumble pay-per-view where Narcissus would be revealed to all. Next up we have the Steiner brothers taking on the Executioners in the ring, the Executioners being Enhancement Talents Dwayne Gill and Barry Hardy. This match is even shorter than the Yokozuna showcase, and it suffers badly due to attention being taken away from the in-ring action. Doink is running around the crowd, pulling pranks and acting the maggot while the cameras have been told to focus on him at the beginning of the match. To be fair, there is more in-ring focus as the match progresses, but Doink running around there in the background is seriously distracting as the Steiners destroy the opposition as expected. From the in-ring action that we do see, Rick Steiner is exceptionally hard-hitting during this match. There's a few moments where it looks like he is intentionally hurting these poor guys. We are shown Bobby Heenan again outside the Manhattan Center, dressed up as Rob Bartlett's aunt as he tries to infiltrate Rob but having no success. This is one of the well-remembered segments of the show and for good reason. Bobby Heenan was just naturally funny and his old lady voice here was fantastic. We are then shown a graphic saying that Razor Ramon, the number one contender for Bret Hart's WWF Championship, will be live next in a special interview. So Razor is in the ring when we get back from the commercial break. Vince interviews Razor and it's all pretty standard. Razor explains that he is numero uno and he will defeat Bret Hart at the Royal Rumble. The only real takeaway here is, when you look back here, Scott Hall was really putting on the whole Scarface thing a whole lot more during his early days as Razor Ramon. WWF's headlock on hunger initiative gets a bit of time in the spotlight here. You may recall seeing this graphic quite a lot during late 1992 and early 1993, particularly in arenas. Headlock on Hunger was a fundraising show held in Madison Square Garden on January 29th, 1993, and it featured some real big names under one roof. Unfortunately, I don't think a proper recording exists of this show, and if it does, it never seen the light of day, but there is a fan cam out there if anyone is inclined to watch, although it is missing a few of the matches. On Raw here, the WWF promoted the show and had Tatanka say that the WWF appreciates the fan support. We are back in the ring next for Shawn Michaels vs Max Moon. Now, say what you want about Max Moon, there isn't really much you can say that hasn't been said already, but he and Michaels have the most competitive match of the night right here, so credit where credit is due. Of course, it's Shawn Michaels, even in these early days it seemed impossible for HBK to have poor showings, but Max hangs in there, looking as silly as he does. Just to confirm for those that maybe didn't know, Max Moon was originally portrayed by Conan, but Conan decided to leave the WWF due to his rise in popularity in Mexico. Basically, the guy no-showed a ton of WWF events. The Max Moon gimmick was then given to Paul Diamond, so you can tell here at one point that Vince McMahon seemed to be pretty invested in the Max Moon character. It was considered a flop. 
Paul Diamond and HBK have a good match here in comparison to what we have already seen during this broadcast. Not really a recommended match, but it's the best of the bunch. The match really suffers due to Rob Bartlett's cringeworthy commentary. He really is trying too hard to be funny, and it becomes really annoying really fast. It doesn't add to the match, and you'll find out for yourself when you watch this back that this guy should not have been anywhere near a commentary headset. Sean gets the win after nailing his teardrop suplex. We then get a commercial for the WWF's brand new Saturday morning show, WWF Mania, and a graphic that announces the main event of the evening. The Royal Rumble report is next with Mean Gene Okerlund, presented by iGoPro, you've gotta want it. Ogerland is here to give us some information regarding the Royal Rumble pay-per-view, letting us know the matches and Royal Rumble participants while superstars deliver short promos. While it's fun to look back on now, it does go on for quite some time, with promos from the likes of Shawn Michaels, Marty Jannetty, Mr. Perfect, Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Yokozuna. After the Rumble report, we are back outside the Manhattan Center and once again, Bobby Heenan is denied access. Next we see a graphic letting us know that tickets are still available for the following week's Raw. Damien Demento vs The Undertaker next, our main event. Undertaker totally no-sells Damien's offense and goes on to totally dominate the match. It's another squash match here, there really isn't nothing to note except, even for such a short match, there are a few missed time spots. It's just a really bad main event, which is a shame. In saying that, the attraction here is seeing The Undertaker, but I have to be honest, it's another squash match and worse still, it's the main event of the first ever Raw. You very well may think I'm nitpicking a debut show here from 1993, and of course there wasn't going to be a 20 minute show stealer during this broadcast, but it really isn't a stretch to expect a deeper main event. Here's something odd, Vince McMahon promised a cage match next week between Woody Allen and Maya Faro. I'd suggest looking up the couple on Google if you want a deeper understanding of the two, it's something I'm not going to get into on this video, but basically, Maya made some allegations against Allen that made the news in late 1992. If this was WWF's attempt at humour, well, it was awful. Obviously the cage match didn't happen, and what is really curious about this TV spot here is that it isn't promoted as a joke, it isn't promoted as satire or a parody, Vince flat out says the match will happen next week on Raw, no punchline, nothing. So weird. Back from break, Vince tries to interview Doink, who's wearing a cast on his arm, mentioning that Crush has warned him about making children cry. Doink claims that the kids don't have a sense of humour, and promises that if Crush was there right at that moment, he'd be crying too. At that point, Crush walks out, warning him to look over both shoulders and stop playing his jokes or else he may be wearing a cast over both arms. Crush then chases Doink around the ring, but he is unable to catch him, leading to Doink laughing his head off outside the ring while Crush looked like a chump inside it. Keep in mind that Crush had a dark match afterwards, and this was the reason why Crush was left standing in the ring, but it looked a bit stupid to end the show this way. The show then ends with Bobby Heenan finally being allowed into the Manhattan Center, but of course, the broadcast is now over. And that was it for the very first Raw broadcast. The main thing that stands out here is that the WWF were still stuck doing these squash matches that they were so accustomed to before the introduction of Raw. The Yokozuna match was under 4 minutes, the Steiners match was under 3 minutes, and the Undertaker match was 2 and a half minutes. Shawn Michaels and Max Moon, thankfully, got just over 10 minutes and it really helped make the match stand out. Matches could easily have been longer by cutting a few segments shorter, such as the Doink interview and Mean Jean's Royal Rumble report, but it is what it is. You have to remember too, and I also have to remember, that this was a different time, TV was different, the WWF was catering to a different audience, so the lack of longer matches should have been expected. This would, of course, change as time went on. Remember, these broadcasts were under one hour long, so you can't really blame them for trying to stuff the show with promotional material, along with the in-ring action. This is a format that wouldn't change really in the weeks that followed. 
The show was considered a success. It was a breath of fresh air in comparison to the dated format that was shown on WWF primetime. And even though the initial matches left a lot to be desired, the idea of weekly live wrestling was a success. Monday Night Raw still airs to this very day, and while the show at the moment is in a real down period, the show has also given us plenty of memorable moments and matches, and it all started in January of 1993 in the Manhattan Center. <laughs> 